So we have introduced the topic of sacrifices. We have a question left to answer, and that is, what specific types of sacrifices will we look at in more detail? And as it turns out, this question doesn't have such an easy answer, because there are so many kinds of sacrifices and different ideas that if you wanted to, you could write a, you know, a whole book or several books about it. So since we can't do that, we can't show absolutely every kind of sacrifice, what I've decided to do is to split into four different sections, the next four, this one and another three, the sacrifices by a different piece. So what I've decided to do for this section and the next three, so four sections in total, is to show a sacrifice or a series of sacrifices involving each of the different pieces. So what do I mean by this? Well, we'll begin in this one with a sacrifice involving the use of the bishops, either for white or for black. And then in the next three sections, we will show sacrifices with the other minor piece, the knight. Then we will look at uh, sacrifices involving rooks. And finally, last but not least, we will look at some typical queen sacrifices. So let's now begin with a look at bishop sacrifices. Specifically, we're going to look at the classical bishop sacrifice, otherwise known as the Greek gift. So the Greek gift, or classical bishop sacrifice, is the first type of sacrifice that we're going to look at. And what it involves is a sacrifice on the point of either h2, if it's black, sacrificing, or h7, if it's white, to sacrificing. Therefore, it involves either the white, light-squared, kingside bishop, or the black, dark-squared, kingside bishop. And this is a very, very dangerous sacrifice to face because what it does usually is it forces the king out onto a more exposed point and also it removes one of the pawns. So it can be a very effective way to blow open the king side. And here at this position, in fact, we see exactly this kind of sacrifice with white who was uh, Alexander Alekhine, a former world champion, he captured on h7 and was the best move. Black played king takes h7. Now white gave a check on h3. And we see again the effect of the king being coaxed out. If black plays king to g6, then queen h5 is checkmate. In the game, black retreated to g8, but all the same, Queen h5 would have been lethal. Black would have had to deal with the threat of queen h8 with mate, so f6, for example. And now, after bishop takes a3, the problem is that if queen takes bishop, then queen h8 check skewers the rook on d8, and it's going to be game over. Alekhine actually went a different route but also a winning route, he took on g7, which was quite nice, a second type of bishop sacrifice. And the point is that if king takes bishop, queen g4 check, and now if the king runs to f8, rook h8 will be checkmate, and if the king runs to f6, then queen g5 will be checkmate. So nothing to be done here. And black, in fact, resigned after bishop takes g7. He could have continued on with a move like f6, but after white simply retreats his bishop to h6, the position is just winning. Black is now missing both his g and h pawns, and white will continue with a very strong attack. Moves like queen h5, rook g3 are all coming soon. Let's take a look at another Greek gift. So 
here we are on move 15 of a game played by the late English Grandmaster Tony Miles with the white pieces. And this is a very, very nice version of the Greek gift and somewhat similar to the last example we saw. Let's check it out. It is Black's move here and he captures on e4. Bishop takes e4, queen to c7, castle. And here this was Black's mistake, rook to d8. He did not see the Greek gift. White now, notice how the Black King is not very well sheltered because, sure, he has a full pawn cover, but his minor pieces, this bishop, for example, is completely out of the defense. There are no knights defending the Black King, and even the other bishop and the queen, they're all tucked away on the queen side. And so white uses this to make this classical bishop sacrifice, opening up the black king. Bishop takes h7, king takes h7, and now queen h5 check. King must go back to g8, and probably what Miles' opponent didn't see was the second bishop sacrifice, and that's why it's quite similar to the last example. Bishop takes g7. Some authors call this sequence, bishop takes h7, followed by another capture on g7 as the double bishop sacrifice. Black has not really much of a choice but to capture the bishop. If he plays a move like f5, by the way, that's necessary because black cannot play such a move as rook e8 since the threat is queen h8 with mate. So if he plays a move like f5, then white will check on h8, and after king f7, we'll grab this rook. The problem for black is that if he captures the bishop, then notice the undefended queen on c7 can be skewered. Now black must move his king, and white will collect a full queen and be up a lot of material. So because of this, after bishop takes g7, black captured on g7. Now white gives a check on g5, king to h8, and we see there is no longer any pawn cover, so we can checkmate the black king along the h-file. In order to do this, white plays queen f6 check, king to g8, and now rook to c4, with the threat of rook g4 check, as well as rook h4. So different ways in which the game might finish, but there is absolutely no defense. Notice that black is up a couple of pieces, but they are not doing enough. Okay, let's check out another couple of examples of the bishop sacrifice. The following position is perhaps the typical or traditional Greek gift, right? And why I say this is because white begins with the offer of the bishop. Bishop takes h7 check. Black needs to capture, otherwise he's simply down a pawn and with a weak king. And now white jumps into g5. And what most chess players think of when they think of the traditional Greek gift or classical sacrifice, it is the capture on h7 or on h2, followed by that knight jump to either g5 or if you're black to g4. And now black has a familiar four choices. King can go to g6, the king can go to h6, to g8, or to h8. In this example, like in most real games, h8 is the least good of all, because queen to h5 check, king to g8, and now queen h7 is checkmate. Now, instead of h8, Black can choose between two good options, g8 or g6. Again, I should say that h6 is usually not appealing because knight takes e6 or knight takes f7 will come in with a discover check. In the case of knight takes f7, it's in fact a double check. The king must step back and now white can, at the very least, pick up the queen on d8. So that leaves two main options, g8 or g6. Now, in this case, we can go back to g8, 
and see what happens. Well, white now invades with the queen, queen to h5, and threatens checkmate on h7. Here's an important thing to keep in mind. When you're trying to gauge quickly whether a Greek gift will be successful or not, ask yourself if your opponent can, on the next move, bring a knight to f6. So, for example, if this knight on e7 was one square away and the pawn on e5 was not here at all, then black could play the move knight to f6, which would cover the h7 square and also attack the queen. Of course, in this case, black does not have a knight to put on f6, and even if he did, the square is covered. So that's the first good sign when thinking if it's a good idea to sacrifice or not. The second point is the bishop on c8. Can that bishop move to f5? Because again, that will control the h7 square. In this case, once again, that's not possible because of the pawn on e6. And so things are looking good for white. White's threat has to be dealt with. Black can play a move like rook to e8. But the problem is that here white will capture on f7 with check. The king must step back to h8. Queen returns, check. This is actually an important point. Many times, even if the Greek gift doesn't work, is not enough to win or to checkmate an opponent, at the very least you can draw by perpetual. King goes to g8. And now a beautiful move here for white. He has many winning moves, but the best move is a4. Seems like a rather unusual move, but the idea is to bring the dark squared bishop from c1 to a3. And we'll see what happens after this. Let's say that black tries to develop. He's actually powerless to prevent white's plan. Now white can, if he wishes, play the move bishop to a3 directly. There is other continuations. Queen a5 check. King steps to d1. And now we see that white has the threat of queen h7 check. And after king f8, queen h8 will be checkmate. Let's take a look at that. Black, let's imagine black plays a move like a6. Queen h7 check. King f8. And now queen h8 is checkmate. And the point of bishop a3 is revealed. The knight is pinned and therefore there is no move like knight to g8. Black could continue on with the move knight to b4, blocking the diagonal, but after rook to b1, there is no way to support the knight, and so sooner or later, black will either have to give up monumental amounts of material or he will be checkmated. So this takes us back to the original position when black went to g8, and finally leaves us with only one option to consider, and that is the far too brave looking move king to g6. Well, what happens if black goes here? White actually will typically continue in a couple of different ways. In fact, there are three very, very common moves, and oftentimes they will all win. The first move is queen to g4, which makes a lot of sense, because now all sorts of discovered checks are being threatened once white moves the knight away from g5. Another option is the move h4. This is actually a very strong move, because the king cannot retreat to any of these squares, since the knight on g5 is covering two of the squares f7 and h7, and the pawn on g7 is being blocked in by the king on g6 that wishes to retreat. And so the idea of this move is simply to threaten pawn to h5 with check and either drive the king to h6 from where it will be in the line of sight of the bishop on c1, or force the king to venture forward even further, and from there it will simply not survive. This is actually in this position the strongest move, I believe. However, it's worth mentioning there's a third option, and that is queen d3 check. Sometimes that will be best. Here, black actually has nothing better than to block with his knight, and white can continue with h4, 
or could also continue with the move g4, immediately recovering his piece if he wants to play it safe. Let's see what happens after the simplest, pawn to h4. Black can maybe play a move like f5, just to at least try and close off access to his king here, and also cover the g4 square. But after pawn to h5 check, the king is forced to step into the line of fire, and now a discovered check with the move knight takes e6, and it's just game over. King goes to h7, knight takes queen, rook takes knight, and white has recovered his piece with a lot of interest. To hopefully provide some instructional value, we'll go back and we'll show instead of the move h4, we'll show the move queen to g4 and see what could happen there. Well, black could play f5. That's the most typical reaction. And now here, white doesn't capture on f6, because if he captures on f6, then after king takes f6, it's not so clear how white's attack will proceed. Instead, he will play the move queen to g3. Black will play f4, and after bishop takes f4, the point is that now he has the move knight to f5, trying to get a little bit of coordination going. White now would play queen to d3, and we still see that long-term problem of the king. It still cannot go to any of these squares. f6 is also ruled out, and of course h6 we know is particularly dangerous because of the bishop along this diagonal. Black could perhaps give a check on a5, that is best. Bishop to d2. Retreat the queen. And now white can even play slowly. He can play a move like c3, just defending his center on d4, knowing that sooner or later he'll recover material with a move like g4 because the black king is paralyzed. Black, in fact, here would be best served by capturing on e5. Pawn takes e5. And now playing move like queen to c4. But of course, if black has to do this, then White is no longer down a piece and uh, has many, many other benefits in his position. In fact, white could even capture on c4 and after pawn takes, simply play h4 and play this position without queens and with two minor pieces each, but uh, where he is actually winning. Okay, now that we've seen this example, let's take a look at something a little bit more complicated. Here's a game played by Boris Spassky with the white pieces, and he's a former world champion, famously defeated by Bobby Fischer. And with the black pieces is Yefim Geller, one of the best players of his time. And one thing that's really nice about uh, learning the classical bishop sacrifice is that even though in its simplest form, most players are familiar with it and they're not going to let you actually play it, there are still variations on the same theme that are complicated enough to fool players, you know, world-class players such as Yefim Geller. Let's see what happened here. Well, Black played the move bishop to f8, and now Spassky uncorked the classical sacrifice. Bishop takes h7, king takes h7, and probably the reason that Geller did not see it is because there is no knight g5 check. However, white had the nasty g6 check, and now black has a few options, but none of them are good enough. He can go to g8, he can go to h8, or he can capture the pawn. Those are his only options. Well, let's see what happens if he steps back to h8. Now white will go knight to g5, creating the devastating threat of queen h5 with mate next move. Black can capture on g6 to stop that, but knight f7 check wins the queen. Notice that recurring pattern of winning the queen with a fork, typically. So that is not a good option. What about f takes g6? Well, here again, knight g5 check. If king h6 or king h8, White will go knight f7 check, winning on the spot. So king goes to g8, 
and now queen to f3 again we see that very vulnerable point on f7 white is threatening the move queen f7 check but he is also threatening the move queen to h3 if black stops the immediate threat on f7 white now reroutes to the h file and there is nothing to be done black's best bet is to sacrifice the knight but of course he will be down too much material if he plays a move like bishop to e7 then white will check on h7 king to f8 and now queen h8 is checkmate in the game geller played king to g8 but after pawn takes f7 or knight to g5 black's position is hopeless spassky played knight to g5 pawn takes g6 of course the threat was to capture followed up with queen h5 mate now queen f3 again we see a transposition to the same position that we just looked at and well we had considered the move rook to a7 but geller decided to not postpone the inevitable and he immediately captured on g5 but after bishop takes g5 it's too much material geller played on for 20 more moves but eventually had to resign that's almost our entire coverage of the classical bishop sacrifice but for a little balance i wanted to show you one game where it's black who makes that sacrifice this example is actually once again the late english grandmaster tony miles showing his class and this one is not quite as easy to find the first move is of course clear bishop takes h2 check classical sacrifice white must accept and now queen to h4 check in this case there is no knight ready to jump from f6 to g4 so the queen jumps in and now king goes to g1 but the problem here is that if black already had his knight on f6 then he could just jump into g4 the threat of queen h2 would be too much and it would be game over so you might be thinking well then there was bishop takes g2 with the double sacrifice well problem there is that now after the move f4 if black continues with check like in that previous example king f2 and now bishop takes f1 and rook takes f1 and now we're getting ready to skewer the queen well guess what this time the bishop is defending the queen on c2 so that's no good after queen check king to e1 we find ourselves down material we have a playable position but certainly white is doing quite well now that his king has escaped danger so this doesn't work so what did miles have in store well he uncorked a brilliant move and a very very instructive type of bishop sacrifice in itself he played the move bishop to f3 this is a, just a brilliant brilliant move the idea is that now there is no f3 there is no f4 and if pawn takes bishop then queen g5 check king has to step onto the h file and now rook will lift up to f6 threaten checkmate on h6 and in fact there is absolutely nothing to be done white will be checkmated in the near future so the bishop therefore cannot be accepted notice how the first sacrifice was a forced sacrifice this bishop on the other hand white does not have to capture however after white's best move knight to d2 only now did black capture on g2 and this makes a huge difference because the knight on d2 blocks the queen's access to the bishop so if now for example white plays a move like f4 then queen to g3 is just crushing black is threatening either bishop h3 or bishop f3 or indeed bishop back to any square with checkmate and there's no good defense the best defense would be rook to f2 but after bishop h3 check the king must step to h1 and now black simply wins this clean rook and continues to threaten checkmate 
So that's really a very, very subtle point. But because of this, white cannot get away with the same trick. Best is the move f3. Now, if queen steps to g3, white has a very clever resource. He has the move knight to e4. This is a brilliant move, knight to e4, pawn takes knight, and now the point is that white can grab this bishop on g2. And if after knight e4, black plays any of these moves, then white will simply take the queen. However, black can instead play the move bishop to h3, and there's still no good defense for white. He is too uncoordinated, so many of his pieces on the queen side, and just not doing a very good job of defending the king. And once again, we see that similar pattern, no pawn on h2, no pawn on g2. In fact, that is how the game more or less continued. Knight went to d2, bishop captured on g2, and here white played the move f3. A good question is, why did white play the move f3? Black lifted the rook up to f6, white played knight to c4. The point is that if black now plays a move like rook g6, then white will capture on g2, and after rook takes queen, king takes rook. White has lost his queen, but he has a lot of material to show for it. In fact, white is doing a little bit better here than black. However, after knight to c4, Miles played the move bishop to h3, and white resigned. There are too many pieces attacking white's kingside, and there is no good defense. So that concludes the study of the classical bishop sacrifice. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope that you guys get to implement this bishop sacrifice, perhaps even the double bishop sacrifice, and have fun using this knowledge. And keep in mind that even though the very simplest types of classical bishop sacrifice are easy to spot and easy to learn and easy to avoid, of course, the more complex ones fool even top grandmasters. So you can always use your knowledge of this particular type of sacrifice. So see you in the next section.